Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's April 29th and it's time for another set of Deep Space Updates. And we start with the rocket launches. Of course, this was a big week. We had Crew 4 on a Falcon 9 launching to the International Space Station. And that meant that in the month of April, we had two Crew Dragon launches to the International Space Station. That's two rockets with crew on from the same launch pad. And like, that's not happened in a very long time. The last time we had two crew launching from the same launch pad within, like, the same month was Gemini 6 and 7, although 7 was launched first and then 6 launched to rendezvous with it. That was in December of 1965. So, uh, yeah, this launch used the same booster as the Crew 3 launch. The, the crew on board were NASA astronaut Shell Lindgren, Robert Hines, uh, ESA astronaut Samantha Christopheretti and NASA astronaut Jessica Watkins, who I believe is the youngest astronaut to make a long duration trip to the International Space Station, or space for that matter. I mean, she will turn 34 in a couple of weeks. Kayla Barron, by the way, who's currently on the space station, she was the previous record holder. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a cool looking launch. So yeah, they had to wait, of course, until Axiom came home. Uh, I'll talk about them in a bit because we have one other launch which has happened in the last week. That is a, a Long March 2, uh, 2C carrying a SuperView Neo Optical Infra Imaging Satellites, two of them, from Jiquan. This is for the Siwei, I think is that, that's a, like a, a, basically a Chinese remote sensing corporation, which is a specialist group underneath China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, which is a Stoke corporation. Anyway, that launched into sun synchronous orbit, and I'm not sure exactly what they do, but it sounds like a commercial uh, imaging satellite where they will be selling the imagery. Uh, so yes, um, the Axiom crew, they finally returned after being delayed uh, a few times. Uh, I think a total of five days worth of delays. So in all, they spent 17 days in space, 15 and a half of that docked to the International Space Station. So this makes it the longest private space flight and the longest uh, stay at the International Space Station by private astronauts. Although Charles Simonier, uh, he spent 24 days in space, but he had to split it across two different Soyuz flights. So yeah, after they came back, they, uh, you know, it was a successful flight. They landed, uh, you know, Monday morning, literally while I was supposed to be pre-flighting a plane, so I couldn't really watch it live. Uh, there was this cool little bit of video shown by, by ESA. This is from a, uh, a camera that's designed to look for meteorites, and it saw, or meteors, and it saw, like, not only the Dragon and the International Space Station traveling in cl close formation, but a meteorite streaking through the screen, which is always pretty neat to do. Now, Axiom, just this morning, they announced that uh, they will be set, they will be uh, providing a seat on a Crew Dragon spacecraft to the United Arab Emirates. So this will be on Crew 6, which is expected in 2023. Now, you might be wondering how a private space company, Axiom, got access to put a private astronaut on a NASA spacecraft. Uh, and the way this worked was that last year, uh, Axiom had already bought a seat on a Soyuz, and so they were going to put a private astronaut on that. But then NASA said, hey, we're still not 100% sure about Crew Dragon. Could we put a NASA astronaut in your seat? So they essentially did a seat swap. NASA gave Axiom a seat on a Crew Dragon, and Mark van der Hey got to go to space for a year flying up in a Soyuz. And honestly, I think Axiom got a pretty good deal based upon the legroom in the Soyuz. But that did ensure that, uh, it, that you know, there was a continuous US pres uh, presence in space. You might remember that uh, Crew 2 had to leave, or well, Crew 3 couldn't get up in time, so there was a small gap between Crew 2 and Crew 3. Uh, hopefully that will not be going forward. We're hoping it's up soon to see a flight from, uh, the, from Starliner that actually shows that it works. So anyway, the United Arab Emirates are obviously leaning big into space technology and they currently have two astronauts who are in training alongside the, you know, the uh, Group 23, right, which is the latest group of astronauts that NASA has hired. This started back in uh, December. So there's two of them and presumably it'll be one of those that actually end up going to the International Space Station. And I've forgotten their names, but I'll put some pictures of them up right now so that, uh, you know, they get credit for being awesome individuals. 
The James Webb Space Telescope is now fully focused, right? Now appreciate the power of this fully focused and almost operational space telescope. Yeah. Uh, it's it's basically set up that we've got this nice photo of everything. It's not totally reached operational conditions. So we've now seen that the temperature of the Mary instrument, the very cold instrument, has reached down to like seven, uh, 7 Kelvin. But the mirrors, which aren't actively cooled, those are still cooling down to their operating temperature. But we did get a nice, you know, awesome image out showing the amazing detail that we are going to see. You can also see some other stuff in here, such as like fa some of the failed shutters, uh, they're failed closed or failed open. Not a problem. Uh, these things were expected. Um, okay. In space, well, uh, you know, Russian uh, you know, cooperation continues in space. Uh, there, we had a, an EVA on the Russian segment to continue working on the European robotic arm. It is now moving free. It is a robotic arm that is designed to, to latch on on both ends. This is pretty common. The, the you know, Canada arm does this as well. So it can latch on to one effector and move the other head around, latch onto the other one and then detach. So this way it can walk around and get to whatever part of the station is, is needed. So that is now demonstrated to be working thanks to this EVA. It is moving free, yay. Uh, also during that EVA, they discovered the problem with the previous MS-21 progress docking where they had to take manual control at the last minute because it wasn't uh, lining up correctly. The Coors antenna had not unlocked correctly. There was a cable that was holding it in place. So a fix was made and hopefully they won't have to manually fly in any more cargo ships for, from now on. And on the far less international, far more secret side of things, we know that Russia is planning to launch their Angara 1.2 rocket. This is the smaller version of the Angara 5. It doesn't have all those strap-on boosters and it is a smaller second stage. Don't confuse it with the 1.2 PP, which used the fatter stage. Um, so this is going to be one of their smaller launch vehicles able to put about three and a half tons into low Earth orbit. We know that they're going to be launching this because they have published uh, NOTAMs, right? Notice to air missions that basically tell pilots, don't fly through here because you might have a rocket fall on you. Uh, so we know that's going to happen. We're not quite sure when. Also, on the subjects of pilots and falling rockets, we're expecting later today that, uh, you know, Rocket Lab will be having a rocket fall down and a helicopter tried to catch it. It was delayed there and back again as the mission. And unfortunately, the weather said, you shall not pass. Hopefully today things are better. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> another aviation related story is that sadly, um, <clears throat> yeah, NASA has allocated no money for the SOFIA, the Stratospheric Affairic Observatory for Infrared uh, Astronomy and the DLR is concurring so they are winding down operations on this amazing airborne observatory which uh, is uh, unfortunately it while it does some very unique things it provides a unique platform for infrared astronomy um, it is just being considered to be too expensive it, you know yes it does have some unique things like if you want to test a new instrument, you can swap it out. You can't do that with a space telescope and you can't get the infrared performance from the ground. So this has, you know, unique capabilities. But yeah, it's just, uh, it's too expensive and it has not been funded. So yeah, probably it will be finished its uh, observing days by September 30th of this year. On the other end of things, NASA has announced some extensions to some missions that are already operational. Mars InSight is getting a mission extension, although at this point it appears the, you know, the solar panels are going to be the restriction. It's looking like they're getting you know more and more dust covered and there are attempts that they make by dropping dirt and stuff around the solar panels to try and not clean them off. But uh, that doesn't appear to be, you know, that appears to be just putting off the inevitable. Uh, on the other hand, NASA has decided that OSIRIS-REx, the spacecraft that took a sample from Bennu and is going to fly past the Earth in 2023 to return it, um, it they've decided that after that it's going to go off on a new mission to fly past Apophis in 2029. It will now be known as OSIRIS-APEX, that is Apophis Explorer. So that's great that it's had a mission extension. And on the asteroid front, by the way, China has suddenly been talking a lot about asteroid missions and asteroid deflections. And 
literally announced that they are planning to demonstrate an asteroid deflection mission in 2025. Of course, NASA right now has the DART mission in flight, expected to perform a diversion at uh, Didymos, or the D Diddy Moon, or Dimorphos, depending who you talk to, uh, in uh, September of this year. Uh, Starlink has finally landed a big aviation deal, which is kind of cool. They're going to be offering in-flight internet service on Hawaiian Airlines. Now, it sounds like this is going to be the big you know, trans-Pacific flights that they run rather than the small inter-island hops. So I presume that is going to need the laser interconnect between the various uh, satellites because there will be no ground stations available. Finally, uh, yes, it is the end of April and as everyone expected, the FAA has once again punted its uh, environmental report for Boca Chica. So yes, we're going to have to wait a little longer. But you know, we already knew that we were going to wait a little longer for a Starship launch because there was imagery leaked from the interior of Booster, uh, Booster 7. Yes, Booster 7's tank and showing the fuel downcomer which has been um, collapsed into an unfortunate triangular cross-section. I'm guessing what probably happened here was that some sort of... Uh, the exterior pressure got higher than the pressure inside that downcomer. Either there was you know, fuel being drained out, leaving a temporary vacuum, or they pressurized the, the oxygen tank and didn't pressurize the fuel tank. Whatever happened, that collapsed. And that is some serious damage, and I think they're already moving on to Booster 8. So yes, everyone's hopes of a Starship Super Heavy launch happening soon have literally been crushed. I'll be back next week with some more Deep Space updates. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.